Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the seminar. Our keynote speaker today, Peter Senji, is a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management. He's a world-leading systems thinker who, among his many accomplishments, has developed the notion of a learning organization. In 1997, Harvard Business Review identified Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline, as one of the seminal management books of the previous 75 years. For this work, he was named by Journal of Business Strategy as the strategist of the century. Please give a warm welcome to Peter Senji. So first off, let me say it's a great honor to be here as part of this celebration. What you all have done in building this center is really very inspiring to us around the world. Thank you. Um, it's also a lot of fun for me to be here in Finland. I don't get here very often, uh, but I have uh, many really great friends and colleagues, Finnish colleagues, uh, who I tend to see all around the world, but occasionally I get to see them here in Finland. So it's always a special treat to be here with them here in Finland, uh, particularly all my friends at Team Academy, who I seem to bump into everywhere. Uh, most recently, it was in Bhutan in China, uh, a week apart. <laughs> so um, I think maybe uh, what I'll do for a few minutes is just reflect a little bit personally, because it's uh, interesting, of course, listening to the way, and particularly Raimo's uh, summary of the journey of building the laboratory, uh, very easy for me to identify, not just with the lab, as I've probably only known you, Ramo and Essa, for 15 years or so, so it hasn't been 30 years, but it certainly has been uh, a journey of that sort for me personally, so I couldn't help but also just kind of connect that with my own personal background. So I'll just maybe say a few words about that, and then uh, Ramo suggested that it would be a very di pretty diverse audience, so I should probably say a little bit about kind of the, the work we've been doing for a long time, basics, uh, so that we all are more or less starting from the same point. And then we'll see wh where we go from there. Um, I was always drawn to this field of understanding systems, even before I probably had a good word for it. Uh, just through my youth, I became very aware of, of a well, at least as I recall, best I can recall, you know, memory is by its nature retroactive as well as retrospective. Uh, but as best I can recall, uh, I probably even had the word systems, but the part that I can recall very clearly, I, I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, and the most powerful experience beside all the time outdoors, playing baseball and with all my friends, the, most vivid experience I had over a period of about 13 or 14 years is watching paradise disappear. When I was a young child growing up in Los Angeles, I can remember sitting in the back seat of my mother and father's car, driving for hours and hours, and all we would see is lemon groves and orange groves. It's kind of hard to imagine this today, uh, because, of course, they're all completely gone, disappeared within about 10 years. Whoosh! Shopping malls and housing developments had replaced all the orange groves and lemon groves. And it's kind of hard to imagine it today. I'm sure many of you have visited Los Angeles. You certainly see it represented in countless films and television shows. Uh, it really was paradise. I mean, it was an incredibly beautiful place. The weather was perfect. The air was clear. There were trees, palm trees, and uh, the orange and lemon groves everywhere. And it was amazing how rapidly that occurred, and probably no coincidence that it was kind of synchronous with my own youth. So at the early stages of my youth, I can remember that vividly, and by the time it was time to go off to college, um, uh, we would have many days when they would be, we'd be warned by the city uh, government that children should not go outside because the air pollution was dangerous. Um, and the place I grew up was surrounded by mountains, uh, but by the time it was time to go to college, you only saw the mountains a few days every month. 
So that happened very quickly. And it made me very aware of something, a dynamic which I would say is probably the dynamic in some ways that unfolds around the world. But of course, because it unfolds around the world, we don't experience it around the world, we experience it in localities. Uh, I spend uh, about a month a year in China for the last uh, almost 15 years now. And of course, what I live through in, uh, in Los Angeles, the people in China live through very quickly. All of a sudden, boom, the air is unsafe. You can't really see anything. Uh, the, the forests are gone. Uh, and in place of them are buildings and roads and lots of cars. I think I was probably about 17 or 18 years old. I kind of have this recollection of a conversation with my mother. Um, and of course, again, all of this is uh, hindsight. So, but I think it's relatively accurate. Uh, when I said something like, well, it seems to me there's one problem in the world. And all the problems in the world arise out of this one problem. And as I understood it then, I, the problem was interdependence. That interdependence is life. I often think it's important for us in this systems field just to remember that systems is just a word. It's become the word, kind of the mainstream scientific word, you might say, systems and complexity, the kind of two mainstream scientific words. To say something which people have understood as long as people have understood anything. We do not live alone. We have never lived alone. We live in a world of extraordinary interdependence. This is a sensibility which defines, in many ways, native awareness. And by native, I mean before the Industrial Revolution, of course, but really before the Agricultural Revolution. Because many people who have reflected on the evolution of culture would probably say that was the first fundamental break, in many ways defined. And of course, it's embodied in almost all of our axial age religions. Not all, but most of them, sometimes very explicit, because those religions had their roots in a time period very similar to the beginnings of organized agriculture, during which time human beings go through this profound shift. There was no word for nature. Most <coughs> native communities have no word for nature. You do not need a word for something that is you. They all have words for Mother Earth. They all have ways of talking about the human in the sky, Mother Earth, Father Heaven. Well, lots of words like that show up in native cultures everywhere. But the word nature is an abstraction. It's very familiar to us because we live in that abstraction. Because somewhere during that journey, in some places of the world, probably as long as four or 5,000 years ago, probably a little more recently, but in many places of the world, literally in the last few hundred years, all of a sudden, the human and nature are two separate things. So while I know I didn't say it that way when I was 17 years old, what I did say was something like, it's very clear to me that we've built this extraordinary web of interdependence. Now you might say it's a web layered on top of a web. Life is interdependence. There is no such thing as living separate. That we inherit. That all species inherit. But on top of that web, we build a second web. Because for sure, this is, as far as any of us know, the first time in human history where simple daily acts are every way, everyday ways of living, very mundane things, like we plug it into the wall, right? Very few of us think of this as an ethical action, charging our device, whatever that device might be. But of course, that device uses electricity. That electricity has to come from someplace. It does not actually come from the socket of the wall. Right? It comes from a, an a electronic grid, a grid that's, that's, uh, that moves electricity all over this part of the world. My guess is here most of it comes from fossil fuels imported probably from Russia. In my country, about 70% of electricity comes from burning coal. And I always try to remind people, we, we get caught up. We're, we're kind of, I would say dazzled might be a good word 
by our technology. But we have to realize none of it works, none of it works if we don't plug it into the wall and burn former living things. So next time we think we're so sophisticated, we should remember we burn shit <laughs> to make the device work. That's how it works. But of course we don't see that system because that's a system we've layered on top of the innate system that defines living. So systems on top of systems. And what I was most aware of having that experience as a child growing up in uh, Paradise Lost, if I can reuse an old phrase, um, was the total out of control nature of the process. Because I'm quite certain if you'd brought together any group of people, children like me, adults, people in government, people in business, people in the middle of the development, boom. Because, of course, all of what happened in Los Angeles was driven 99% by private development and the opportunity to exploit possibilities for building things and making money. But if you had asked any of those people, this is a, a way of talking about, I know I didn't quite understand them, but I felt it. If you had asked any of those people, do you want to destroy the orange groves and the lemon groves? Do you want to destroy the possibility for children playing outside? Do you want to destroy the possibility that children can walk to school by themselves? Do you want to destroy the air? Of course, they would have all said no. How many of us want to destroy species? Really? You wake up in the morning and go, ah, what a beautiful day to destabilize the climate a bit more. <laughs> of course we don't think that way. No one wants to produce the systemic outcomes that we consistently produce. And what I started to realize is that is almost a kind of, to me, the archetypal definition of systems intelligence, or let's just say systems ignorance. One of the faces that paraded along during Ramo's presentation was a very, very dear friend, uh, Danella Meadows. Dana and I were very close. She died way too young. Um, and Dana was one of the most articulate writers, in my experience, in the systems world, at least in the US, the only environmental writer I know who ever was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. I mean, she wrote beautifully. But she kind of wrote as she talked. Those of you who aspire to write, just remember, it's really simple. If you can write as you talk, your writing will be good. Then your talking will get better, too. But most of us, of course, you learn to write in school, so we don't write as we talk. We write as we wrote for our seventh grade teacher, so we could impress her or him by how much we knew. Unfortunately, most academics never escape that, trying to impress somebody by how much they know. It's another subject. Um, but Dana um, was a farmer. She lived on a farm in New Hampshire, a communal farm, a lot of colleagues, many of whom were working on the same issues. Uh, many of you may, may remember Danella Meadows as the co-author of The Limits to Growth, one of the books that Rimo put up and showed a couple of the simulation curves and pointing out that, you know, it was all very crazy and radical to most people 50 years ago. Uh, it was published actually in 1972, so it's really only a little over 40 years ago. Um, I was at MIT when it was published. I was a graduate student, and I got to know all the people working on the project, very good friends. Um, but today, of course, we have all these sustainability issues, um, which is a relatively new kind of jargony term, not a very good term. A good term. I think it's played a useful function, because I too have been part of using this term. It's played a useful function because it has at least corrected one profound error we were all making for a long time, which was to separate the social and the environmental. So, of course, we have a lot of environmental activists. We have many organizations that have grown up around the world to kind of draw attention to the imbalances we create in the environment. Uh, and then we tend to have separate organizations that are drawing attention to the plight of the poor and social inequity. Now, this has been a big error because the two are not separate. Poor people always suffer most. 
when there's environmental stress. And people who are really trying to figure out how they're going to live and if they have any reasonable food for the next few days cannot be good stewards of their natural resources, even if they would really want to do so. So the fragmentation of social and environmental issues has been a big mistake. And, and ironically, a lot of these same organizations compete for various kinds of philanthropy or government grants compete with each other, you know, can you give the money here or do you give the money here? And they don't work together. They're, in a word, not very systemic in their practice, even though they're trying to help the world understand a particular set of very systemic problems. So that, too, kind of identifies one of the key elements. It doesn't really help much to have a systems awareness up here. It all comes down to what we do, how we operate, how we think and act. So I eventually came to this very simple, I guess I would say uh, gut level, you know, here, understanding of all these systems issues before I could really articulate them very well. But as I remember telling my mom, I, I think there's this one problem. It's the level of interdependence has grown extraordinarily in the world, and we do not understand it. Because I knew very well, as I said, that nobody wanted to produce the consequences that development in Los Angeles had produced. Nobody was trying to accomplish that. And yet that's exactly what was accomplished in a quite a predictable, you could even say systematic manner. Inputs in, outputs out. It's very systematic, very predictable. And I guess that's when I start to understand why this system stuff is so important. The archetypal system for you and I, human beings, for most of us, is the family. And when Raimo had his list of different types of systems, of course, that was up there. Because as human beings, we grow up in families. If we just simply ponder, and I don't mean to impose this, so if it makes sense, just ponder for a moment the suffering that you have seen firsthand produced in families. And that suffering could range from hurt feelings to miscommunication to many, many forms, of course, we know very common of abuse. And then ask yourself the question, is it anybody's goal to produce this suffering? Is anybody trying to hurt feelings or hurt people? and yet we consistently produce those outcomes. That's systems ignorance. And I, the word is probably not the best word, and I'm only using it to juxtapose it to systems intelligence, but that's probably a pretty technically accurate word. In the Confucian tradition, it's considered a sin to be ignorant. Not a sin like the Western, you know, original sin kind of sin, but really a fundamental error to be ignorant of that with which you could, if you worked at it, be aware. So we live in a world of systems ignorance, and that's an abstract way to say we live in a world where we consistently produce suffering for each other, for other humans, and for living creatures of all sorts, which nobody intends. And you really don't need to say anything more than that to know why we're sitting in this room. That's it. It's not abstract. It's not intellectual. It's not a, an argument based on some heavy theory of any sort. It's simply a reflection on our experience. If we really reflect on our experience, we can come to this conclusion. Now, I'm obviously articulating in a particular way, a way that's meaningful for me. Um, because of just my own life journey, as I said, kind of brought back to my awareness by uh, listening to the history of the center here. Because there's many centers like this. Not a lot, not nearly as many as there could or should be. Uh, but there's plenty of places in the world where people have come together with some version of this awareness. Some version that as a species, as societies, we are blind. We have so little ability to be aware of the consequences of our own actions. 
And the real irony, to put it in a kind of a classic dilemma form, our interdependence has grown and our awareness of the interdependence has declined. And that, in a nutshell, I would say is the more succinct way to express what I was feeling by the time I was ready to go to university. If you imagine those two curves, they have been diverging for a long time and probably by and large, they continue to diverge. And they won't diverge forever because we're just a species. We're not particularly significant beyond that. We're just another species. And we're actually a very young species, very, very young in any kind of biological or evolutionary terms. And all species exist only in a niche. That's biology 101. A species in a niche coexists. No species exists except in a niche. And it's a very interesting question, and maybe a very good question for us gathered here this morning, to just ask this. What is our niche? And we can consider that first just geographically. Obviously, it has to be considered in terms of different types of ecosystems, but just think of it geographically. There's plenty of examples of human cultures surviving for thousands of years. There's probably more examples of those that don't survive that long, societies that survive, but in some case, thousands of years. I know a lot of native cultures in, in the United States. I've had a good fortune of having a lot of contact with a lot of the native cultures. Of course, you have native cultures here, not far away. If you just go a few hundred miles to the north, you'll find lots of people who live not too different than they lived 5,000 years ago. The Blackfoot Indians say they've been there for about 15,000 years, where they live today. Uh, that'd be roughly true for quite a few of the older Native American cultures. The primary migratory paths, and this is all in their own teachings, we now have this confirmed genetically by tracing the movement of genomes around the planet. Um, their primary migrations started about 15,000 years ago during the last ice age when there was a land bridge connecting what today is Russia and Alaska. Um, many apparently also migrated by boat, but that was a primary migratory route, and they've been there a long time. So there's not the problem that it's impossible for human beings to survive and thrive in a niche. We have plenty of examples of it, all of which are local. They're in particular geographies. And to me, to put this same puzzle, and basically all I'm trying to do is kind of, in many ways, articulate a puzzle, or what I would consider a, maybe our, our core dilemma. It appears that this species is kind of hell-bent on making the planet Earth our niche. I mean, that's one very simple way from a biological perspective to articulate climate destabilization. We are actually altering a very complex set of global systems which shape weather, climate. So you could say, well, the trajectory of our economic, technological, and population growth, the trajectory of all three of those multiplied together, now makes us an agent shaping life on the planet and the conditions for life on the planet. Of course, as I've been already saying, mostly in a state of complete unawareness. In fact, still, you could say a lot of people can't believe that this could be occurring. And I would say it's not because they're crazy. It's never occurred in history before. So it's very natural if someone says, well, human beings are altering the global climate, that people would naturally respond initially, well, that's impossible. The, you know, we're just a, there's just a few of us. You know, I travel for miles in my country and I don't see people. And I know most of the earth is not covered with human beings. And sure, our population is a lot bigger than it was 50 or 100 or 300 years ago. But still, which, you know, how can we be altering the planet's climate? But we seem to be doing that. While I was in China recently, about a month ago, the World Wildlife published uh, its annual State of the Planet report in which 
and this was covered in the newspapers in China. China, by the way, there's a tremendous amount of environmental activism in China. You don't tend to see that from uh, far away, but when you're close, you see it. Um, so this was uh, covered quite extensively in China, the State of the Planet report of the World Wildlife uh, Fund, WWF, you all, of course, know them, probably the, the best known environmental NGO in the world, uh, that in the last years we've lost 50% of the wildlife species in the last 30 years. Again, who's trying to make that happen? The short answer, of course, is you and me. We, the big we. Um, so to just kind of keep that one frame of the puzzle, since all organisms only exist in a niche, the obvious question for any organism, if you consider its change and its growth this, as humans, as this particular species has, um, what's our niche? Which to me leads to a very interesting question. If our niche is to be the planet, what's the consciousness that that will require? Because Probably, given the particularities of this species, we cannot exist in any niche without some way of thinking, believing, some mythos, some set of ideas, some set of overarching ways of thinking and talking that enable us, since language is so important in how this particular species functions, not unique to us, of course, but very important in how this species functions, that we'll have to have a way of thinking and talking that allows us to exist in a niche. If you spend time with any of the native peoples who have existed in some geographic niche for many thousands of years, you will immediately discover that they have ways of talking, they have ways of being, they have ceremony, they have cultural praxis, which helps them continually reflect on this awareness. For example, the Blackfeet, the Blackfoot Indians, have no nouns. Theirs is a language with no nouns. By the way, that's the way David Bohm got the idea for the real mode. It was proposed to him by a, a man named Leroy Little Bear an elder of the Blackfeet who was pointing out to him, this is a little conversation Essa and others and I have been having. David, of course, very famous physicist, some of you may have heard of him, who just had come to the point where he was convinced that while the mathematics of quantum theory were terribly compelling, very, 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 maybe zero physicists experienced quantum theory. They knew it here. They knew it in their mathematics. They did not know it here and here. And if we don't know something here and here, we really don't know it. And he had come to the conclusion that we should reinvent a language. And he was inspired by this idea that what if you had a language with no nouns? Of course, nouns are a wonderful way of reinforcing a certain um, confusion. Right? We see things. Nouns give us a perception and a linguistic way of reinforcing a perception of definiteness. This is the way it is. This is a seat. This is a person. These are shoes, right? None of which, of course, is accurate. It's proximate. It may be useful, but it's not the truth. There's nothing in the physical world that ever stays put, that stays in one form. Form is in a continuous process of flux. You might find interesting to know that one of the most uh, common phrases, the black feet, like to use. This is a way of articulating life. They talk of surfing the flux. Surfing the flux. They cannot describe things. They can only describe processes. Now that's a linguistic evolution that has helped them remain harmonious with their geographic niche for 15,000 years. So it's not that human beings cannot do this. We know plenty of examples where human beings can do this. We just don't know a lot, and most of them have been more or less eradicated over the past 100 to 200 years as this global industrialization process has not only destroyed species, but cultures. So again, the irony, 
at the very time when we're starting to appreciate a little bit of what we need to know, the sensibility of people who have existed for thousands of years, we're busy doing everything we can to destroy those people. Mary Catherine Bateson is a woman I met through Dana, uh, very interesting woman, anthropologist. Uh, her father was a man named Gregory Bateson, who many of you may know in the history of systems. Her mother was a woman named Margaret Mead, who I'm sure many of you know, also a famous anthropologist. And Mary Catherine and I were traveling around South Africa together for about two weeks, about uh, just a little before uh, apartheid ended. So this is around 1988 or 89. And I'll never forget, she said something, I never heard anybody say this before. It really touched me. She said, I have the same passion for the conservation of cultural diversity that a biologist will have for the passion of conservation of species diversity. Nature produces variety. For those of us, every one of us in this room, to a high degree, probably a very, very high degree, who've grown up in the industrial age, which is the age we live in today, it's not over. <laughs> That's a terrible error <laughs> to say that the information age replaced the industrial age. Hardly. The in information age is the industrial age. Because the whole industrial age has been punctuated by radical shifts in dominant technology. That is the industrial age. Schumpeter was the first one to articulate that in a very clear way. And many have since. Uh, in the industrial age, this linguistic consciousness of focusing on things becomes augmented, accelerated, deepened, spread more widely by a fascination with devices. Or as Lewis Mumford wrote many, many years ago, when he, I think, rightly called the Industrial Age the Machine Age. And I couldn't help but think, as I was kind of reflecting on the journey of the systems field, again, as Raimo was, 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 was uh, summarizing it, that so much of that language, so much of the applications, not all, but so much was really to the effective organization of machines and effective machine thinking for the organization of human work. I remember my professors in operations research, and I know that they were really neat people. This is when I was an undergraduate uh, at Stanford before I came to MIT as a graduate student. Uh, but there was nothing in them that ever touched me as how I could better understand what it meant to be alive. Most of the systems field is an outgrowth of many different branches of engineering. I, too, am trained as an engineer. My mentors, most of them, came out of that tradition. I think it's a wonderful tradition. I think it's provided many schools for understanding interdependence, feedback dynamics, and even in cases when you're serious about it, complex nonlinear feedback dynamics, which start to give you a little feeling for life. But it's very clear to me at this point in time, our survival, in all likelihood, literally depends not on understanding complex systems, which the very word, of course, for 95% probably of the Finnish people, I certainly would say it's 98% of Americans, the very word system sounds like machine. Right? Hey, we have a systems problem around here. We need to get a systems expert. We all know what that typically means. Our computers aren't working correctly. Or, of course, the other most common use of the word system is, hey, it's not my fault. It's the stupid. You ever heard anybody in a company say this? <laughs> so neither of which, which is what we're talking about here. A simpler word for here would simply be life, which is by its nature systemic, interdependent, interconnected, continually unfolding, continually in a state of flux. So Partly what I'm trying to do to kind of reflect with you on what was evoked as I was sitting listening this morning, obviously just sharing my own personal journey a bit and the, the kind of key questions that have gradually crystallized for me. And again, I'm, I'm just saying this so I can kind of share with you my own way of looking at this. Um, how do we start to close the gap between the interdependence we create and the interdependence we understand? That would be kind of a simple, kind of technical way of saying it. Um, 
how do we understand the ways of thinking and being that will be required if, in fact, the Earth, the planet itself, is to be our niche? That will be a slightly different way of saying it. Because, by the way, if that doesn't happen, since we do know, I think this is a pretty good first principle. I mean, it's all just ideas when all is said and done right. But for me, it's a pretty good first principle that all species only survive in a niche. So therefore, that's a good way to phrase it. And if the answer to that question is we won't develop the ways of the, the, the awareness, the ways of thinking, talking, and acting consistent with surviving in the niche called planet Earth, we won't survive in that niche, period. We'll end up maybe in a whole cluster of smaller, more, lo more local niches. That's probably not a future any of us would desire, since probably it will only come about in concert with some sort of larger collapse. But there's a, a third way to express the same question. Um, as you can tell, I, I guess I've, I was fortunate enough, I didn't really have S.S. Sarnen as a professor when I was a student, but I did have a, some very, very good philosophy professors. While I was busy being a, a major in systems engineering, I was being a minor in philosophy, and you know, hence all these problems <laughs> that still exist. Um, I heard this question articulated a little different way about, uh, about three or four months ago. And as I was listening, I was thinking of this story. Um, this is a, not a technical way or even a kind of rational, succinct way. But it's a very meaningful way for me because when I lived through this little experience, I thought, yes. So one of the areas that uh, we've worked in for a lot in the last 10 years is fisheries. Um, again, Raimo's summary, one of the, uh, the archetypal understandings that has pervaded a lot of the field of understanding human and ecological or environmental itch, uh, it, uh, interfaces is the tragedy of the commons. I imagine many of you have heard of that. Raimo included it in his summary. Um, and fisheries are a perfect example. 75, 80% of the world's wild fisheries are either collapsed or near collapse. Um, the, most of the rest are on that path, but not all. In the last decade, 15 years, there's actually quite a few remarkable success stories of the restoration of fisheries. Not nearly enough, but again, it's not like we can't do this. It's very important, just as I was pointing out about human cultures and societies that have lived in harmony with their natural environment for long periods of time. We cannot stay, make the statement that human beings do not know how to do this. It's just we're not doing it. So there's a, quite a few wonderful success stories of restoration of fisheries. Uh, generally, the claim is made, the Environmental Defense Fund is the uh, NGO in the US that's been most active in this. And, and they would say that today, if you take the Pacific coast of North America, north of Mexico, so then you've got California, Oregon, uh, Washington State, uh, British Columbia, and up to Alaska. You take that whole swath of about four or 5,000 miles of coastline. About 80% of the fisheries, all throughout, wild fisheries are now managed. They have some sort of quota system. Uh, very often, it depends on the species, they'll have protected areas where they know this area is crucial for the breeding and reproduction of that species. So they'll have no fishing areas. They'll have management quotas of different sorts so people can only catch so much. And guess who is the key to making this happen? Just factually. Almost anybody who's been involved in this work, any of the scientists you've asked, how have these success stories occurred? Who do you think is the absolute critical actor? in these success stories. What would you guess? This is a little systems intelligence, or systems intuition test, we'll call it. Go ahead, somebody said it. The scientists are important, for sure, because you've got to have good ongoing processes of tracking the population, what they do we call the census. A common term today is a tax, total allowable catch. 
So that has to be a scientifically based number. We know during this season or this year, here's the total amount that can be caught to not further deplete the population and help it in its process of restoration. So the scientists are important, but they're not who I was referring to, because the scientists are trying to do this in every fishery around the world. And there's only a relatively small number that have, have, have really started this regenerative process. The local fishermen. In every single case, it is the leadership of the fishing communities themselves, or as the people who work in this area call, the fishers. It is the, leader of the leadership of the fishers themselves that is absolutely crucial. Um, so we've been getting involved in that, we being a lot of us interconnected systems folks in many ways, goes right back to the inspiration of people like Dana Meadows years ago, because it's actually, I think, an area where all of us can learn a lot. Uh, in many situations where you have severely depleted e ecological conditions, the restoration process will take centuries. But oftentimes marine ecosystems are relatively resilient if they're not pushed too far. Uh, fish populations, it varies of course by species, breed relatively fast if you're dealing with prawns or various uh, uh, mollusks. They could actually regenerate literally in two to three years. So it's a great place to learn. It's one of the reasons we got very involved. I mean, I believe from a, just from a strategic standpoint, in my own personal view as a systems person, probably the single most important do, thing to do is find the places where people are doing it well. Where this, I would say, innate systems intelligence, which we are all born with, and I'll return to before we wrap up, because I think it's maybe the single most important insight that I think now we have a lot of evidence for. This innate systems intelligence really is being brought into play on a scale, in a setting, around issues that we all care a lot about. So we've spent a lot of time trying to understand, work with the people in this restoration process. So in that context, I was in uh, La Paz, Mexico. If you can picture the Baja, California. Um, I grew up in Alto. That's what they would call where I grew up. In America, we call it California, but to the Mexicans, it's Alta, California. Baja, California is that long, uh, three, four hundred uh, 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 thousand mile peninsula that extends down, and the very tip of it is La Paz, with a very, very historically rich uh, clam fishery. And the, the, the Sea of Cortez, the big body of water between Baja California in the mainland of Mexico is the, the source of about 80% of the marine life, uh, productive life of in the country of Mexico. So that whole area is very important and there's a lot of efforts for fishery restoration throughout. But it's very difficult because unlike Alto, out my California growing up, and the United States and British Columbia and the places where this restoration has occurred, you do not have rule of law that's very reliable, as many of you know, I'm sure. The country of Mexico is in a state of chaos and disintegration because of the drug trade, because of the course of the demand for drugs in a country I live in. Uh, that's made it very difficult for the marine biologists and the fishing communities to do this. But we were there, and they're actually in the last few years Something quite remarkable has happened in the, in the clam fishery of Baja, California. As I say, I'm always kind of drawn to where is it happening? How do we understand that? And in this little conversation, I think I saw something which I'd never really seen as clearly as I saw it. This was about, uh, I think this was in May of this year, so quite recent. So we're sitting in a circle, kind of a typical systems practice we've gravitated to over the years. Not a new practice, by the way, every native people I've ever spent any time with have that as their core governance system, the circle. So we're sitting in a circle, and uh, some of the members of, it's called NOS, Noreste Sustainabilidad, that's the NGO that is based in La Paz, mostly marine biologists who, because they understood it will come to the fishing communities, they located their office in the middle of the fishing community. And for many years, they've been building different quality of relationships. Scientists often don't build good relationships with the fishers. This is important for all of us, because most of us in this room have this common liability. 
we've been way, way, way overeducated. Right? Many of us have been in school pretty much our whole life. And now you're sitting with people who may, very few of whom have ever completed secondary education. No one that I know of in the leadership of that fishing community are, are university graduate. And then you have these scientists who get kind of parachuted in with all their PhDs. And they're going to help the fishing community restore their fish. You get the sense of the problem right away. The very first thing NOS, Norte Sustainabilidad, they just abbreviate as NOS, which of course in Spanish is also we. So that's what they call themselves, NOS. The very first thing NOS did is they located their office in an old rundown building in the middle of the fishing community. They, they kind of refurbished it a little. It's not fancy, but it works. The next thing they did is they realized the children, like all communities, their first concern is always for their children. And the children, guess what? They're Mexicanos. They love foosball. They love football. They would play soccer all day long if they could. So they built a soccer field for the kids. The kids had no place to play soccer. So they built a soccer field. Marine biologists educated at all these universities. Their first intervention in the community is to build a football field. It's just a dirt field. But before that, the kids from the fishing community had no place to play football. And of course, when the kids play football, the parents come around and they all watch and they cheer and they get excited. Again, they're Mexicans, they get very excited. <laughs> and the football team gets quite good. The kids are actually very talented and they have most made, had some reasonably good coaches. And so their first revitalization strategy for the fishery was the soccer field. The second strategy, this they started working on within a year or so, was organic farming. Now, I'm telling you this story in a little detail, because I don't know about you, but I get lost in all the abstractions about systems intelligence. But when I can see it and feel it, it starts to sink in. Their second strategy was organic farming. The practical aspect of this is very simple. To restore a fish, one of the things you almost always have to do is stop fishing. Where would food come from? Well, all of a sudden, the whole community, which is called El Mangle, the whole community is really getting into their organic gardens. And within a year or so, they're producing a lot of really nice vegetables. And they're very proud of them. And of course, they're cleaning up things so they have a more orderly physical arrangement so they can grow their food. And in the meantime, they're not fishing at all because as they're kind of building coherence and commitment in the community, the kids, the gardening, the markets they create for their food, and of course, employment opportunities for many of the people are very important during this process. So they're working on job creation, and some enterprise development, microfinance, and all those kind of things, you know, are part of a, a early stage development in very poor countries. Um, their clam fishery is starting to rebound. And again, this is a species that can regenerate quite quickly. So they had a census, uh, I think this was about March or April, where their local clam fishery was up to about 3 million clams again. And it was basically zero, or near zero, two years ago. So we're sitting in this circle reflecting on this process. And by the way, they're still not harvesting. They want the population to get back, and the scientists and the fishing, fishers agree, to about four to five million before they can start reasonable harvesting. So we're sitting around this circle, reflecting on this extraordinary journal with, journey with members of NOS, uh, several of us visitors who are there trying to help support real systemic change in settings like this. And many of us know each other. We've worked together now for about five years. And several of the fishers joined us. And I'll never forget the story, and this is my long preamble <laughs> to get to this little story, told by Armand, who I found out later had actually been arrested for illegal fishing and jailed. That doesn't happen much, but it does happen occasionally. It's, it's what's supposed to happen, because the government's been trying to shut down this fishery for years. But the government can't do it. The only people who can do it are the fishing community themselves, because they're the only ones who can enforce it. So Armand apparently had been arrested 
and jailed for some time because of illegal fishing. He had a reputation as a kind of a, you know, a guy who would do what he needed to do to make the money for his family and him he needed to, which of course is, is the basic issue for all these people. It's not like they are criminals, but their whole history is fishing and they're going to fish. And I've literally heard people in these settings say, we are racing for the last fish. It breaks your heart when you hear people say that. But then you realize their reality is such that they really don't see an option but to race for the last fish. So Armand is telling this story. And the story is this. He said, when I was a child, I always wanted to go with my dad fishing. But he wouldn't take me. He said, too dangerous, can't take you in a boat, you're a little kid. And then he said, when I was about six or seven, he said, but if you get good grades in school for the next two years, I'll take you fishing with me. So I says, I get really, I work really hard, I get really good grades in school. And then, I'm about eight or nine years old, and my dad says, you can come fishing with me this morning. Now, these are clam fishers, so what they do is they dive. Okay, so they dive, they surface dive. They, they don't use any artificial air. They've been doing this for many generations, so they can dive. The water is maybe mo no more than uh, 10 meters or so, so it's like seven to 10 meters depth. Um, so he's in the boat with his dad. His dad dives off the side with his big bag to gather the clams. And Armand's sitting there. And he's sitting there. And he's sitting there. And his dad doesn't come up. And of course, first he thinks, well, of course, you know, my dad, he can dive for a long time. His dad still doesn't come up. And he starts to panic. Should I jump in? I mean, I can't save my father, but I mean, I, 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 he's not here. And Armand said, I had no idea how long this was, but it, of course, as a as eight, year old boy it felt like forever. And finally, his dad pops up. Armand said, I have no idea how long it was. It was at least hours for me. His dad comes up out of the water with this huge smile on his face. And he says, I only hope that someday you will see how beautiful it is. Another way to say it. We have to rediscover our love for the natural world. Armand is now a famous leader of the restoration of his fishery. And what has allowed him to do that was very clear. And that's why he told us that story. And he took, by the way, about an hour to tell that story. <laughs> because he had discovered something that it will start with the emotion of love. We are systems thinkers by our nature. We are born. We are predisposed. We are biologically predisposed to love. Now in universities and academia, we don't talk about this a lot for all kinds of reasons. Uh, the word gets very confused in our cultures. We don't really use the term you know, agape much anymore. But long enough ago, you know, when you had multiple terms to express different aspects and contexts of love, we had different words. In our modern culture, of course, Finnish, I don't know a clue about. <laughs> Maybe you still have some of that. Uh, but still, uh, a great teacher for me, someone who I always love just kind of recognizing because this is beautiful opportunity for me to reflect and he's been uh, the person who's probably taught me as much about reflection as anyone and I've been taught by some wonderful wonderful teachers he's a biologist his name is Humberto Maturana some of you may have heard of him he's very famous in the systems world M-A-T-U-R-A-N-A -A -A. he was the teacher of a man named Francisco Varela Francisco and he later became uh, colleagues and co-authors um, famous in biology for what's called the Santiago theory of cognition. The first biological theory. Umberto is an experimental biologist by training. Did his postdoc research at MIT with a man named Jerry Letvin. Very famous work on, the, bi on the, the, the biology of perception. How a frog sees a fly. Very, very famous work in biology. 
That was Umberto as a graduate student. Then he returned to Chile, and the Santiago theory of, Chile, of cognition is, of course, from Santiago de Chile, where Umberto has lived throughout all the turmoil of the last 40 years in Chile. He's revered by Chilenos because he stayed. A lot of the intellectuals fled. In the Pinochet era, he stayed. He says, I, I'm a Chilean. I belong here. So Umberto makes some very interesting points. Umberto makes lots of interesting points. But pertinent to the point I was just making with you, that this is not cultural. We have a tendency to think that a lot of our ethical norms, a lot of our understanding of relationships is based on our cultural uh, systems. And of course, that's true. Most every child learns from her or his mother about relating to other people, and a lot from her or his father. So yes, of course, this is influenced by culture. But Umberto has a very radical perspective as a biologist. He said, we are a loving species. And he uses to illustrate this many, many things. But that's, of course, what was kind of flooding through my awareness as I listened to Armand's story. You all know this in evolutionary biology, right? The theory of the opposable thumb, right? We're the only species. We used to say that. We're the only species with this. We know that's not actually quite accurate anymore. The Bonobo chimps also have an opposable thumb. But it's a very significant distinction in our evolution, which, of course, allows us to grab things. The, con the standard kind of evolutionary theory about the opposable thumb and the evolution of cognition, awareness, ways of operating, which is basically the gist of Umberto's Santiago theory of cognition, that it is about structural coupling, it's about our harmony with our environment, not our thought processes. But that we can come back to. But Umberto says, no, this is not just for grasping. We are not only the species that grasps. We are the species that caresses. It is biological, not just cultural. That's why when Umberto, this very eminent biologist, says, we are a loving species, it's worth noting. And when I heard Armand's story, I realized that, yep, and that's why we have an innate systems intelligence. They are two facets of the same thing. This is through our ability to extend our compassion, if I could use that term, very similar idea. Our empathy, our appreciation, our ability to feel what others feel, our ability to care, our ability to actually build a relationship based on mutual care. Those are all manifestations of, in the, year, in the words we're using here, systems intelligence. We are a loving species. So a third way to articulate my dilemma or puzzle I wanted to share with you is that. How do we fall in love once again with the world? Not just with another, not just with those close enough to us, but with our life and with the world. In the last five to 10 years, I've spent most of my time working in education. I'm traveling a little tour around the world with my colleague from Denmark here, uh, Dr. Meta Bull, uh, who's kind of helping to knit together remarkable innovators in education. And, and from this experience, one of the things I've seen, not from this last few months, but over the last 10 years, watching systems ideas and tools for understanding systems in the hands of three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, you will be stunned to see that innate systems intelligence showing up. The best analogy I've been able to kind of find for this, imagine, you know, children were never given a musical instrument. There would not be a lot of musicians in the world. Children are not given any of the tools and artifacts and processes to cultivate their innate systems intelligence. But we're born with musical intelligence. The instrument allows us to cultivate it. Or the joining together and singing in some sort of organized process of singing together allows us to cultivate it. We have none of that for systems intelligence. But we have immense innate systems intelligence. It's who we are. We are a loving, 
systems intelligence species. And the various gaps I was trying to characterize before will only be closed. I've come to the conclusion, in my opinion, will only be closed if we discover that again. Yes, sir. 